Connect the Eggs, where our guest today is Marcel Pettipa. Marcel, welcome to the show. How are you, man? I'm great. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Stoked to have you here. Thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, really it's a pleasure. It. Why don't you give us a, uh, a quick rundown of who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Marcel. I'm the CEO and founder at a company called Parakeeto, and our whole thing is helping digital agencies and creative agencies measure and improve their profitability. It's uh, a simple problem that's really hard to solve, and uh, our whole MO is making sure that they have visibility into the data that they need to make decisions every day about people, projects, and time that end up influencing how successful their business is financially. Yeah, I love this, you know, and there's no shortage of like sort of self self help books for the agency owner or whatever. And people who know the show know that I work in the agency business, so they have the context of of my my line of questioning here, a line of line of conversation. But um, the uh, you know the it seems like no matter who I talk to, even at really high levels of what I would consider successful for a small boutique agency. Uh, it's funny how few of them still even even measure profit if they do at all. <laughs> like, it's just like, I mean, the idea of being profitable, I think for a lot of them is kind of, a, eh, well, you know, it'll come or we'll just bill more money or we'll just do whatever. And it's not ever really done in a way where they're being thoughtful about profit, you know, maybe at a certain mm. level. But, you know, for a lot of the little boutique shops, it's it's a challenge for sure. So what drove you to get into like this line of work? Can we talk a little bit about your past? I mean, is there some agency experience there? Are you a data engineer? Yeah. Like, where does this come from? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. So um, my career started in sales and marketing. I was an account manager for Apple. That was kind of my first real job uh, with like a real company. And I left that actually to start my first agency. Uh, and we were doing real estate virtual reality services back in like 2015, 2016, before you could like do it with your iPhone. We would go into a house with the two cameras and yeah, yeah, we'd have like it. that. Yeah. We'd take like a bunch of shots with a wide angle camera. We'd have to stitch like 16 images together into a 3D image. Then we had to load it into software and then build a 3D model of the house. So it was like super labor intensive. And this is also 2015 in Moncton, New Brunswick in Canada. So it's a buyer's market. Houses are sitting on the market for like three years. And the average price of a house uh, where I lived at the time was like 150000 Canadian dollars. So I'm trying to justify a price point for the 30 hours of work that it takes <laughs> to do all of this work to a real estate agent who's like, I might sit on this house for three years and make whatever the commission is on a $150,000 house, not that much, right? And so very, very quickly, I ran into these challenges with the unit economics of a service, not having enough margin there to scale beyond me doing the work and very quickly realized that this could be nothing more really than a lifestyle business for me and ended up walking away. So that was where I really became familiar with these challenges. From there, I got interested in software as a service, tried to start a couple of so software companies. And that's how I met my co-founder, Jared, who ran a big agency in Boise doing uh, custom software development and integrations. And I remember him calling me up one day and saying, dude, I spend like two days a week in spreadsheets just trying to answer these simple questions about, are we busy? How much work can we take on? What clients are profitable? Like, what do we need to do? He said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I'm sure that other agencies are struggling with this. And so that was kind of the entry point into exploring this problem. And uh, we haven't turned back since. That was almost six years ago now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's super cool. Um, yeah, I mean, Mike's presently in Idaho and I'm from Idaho originally. So that's cool that he's a Boise guy. So uh, yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. It's funny that, um, you know, your story about the the margins in, in a project like that, you're doing 30, 40 hours to put this one tour together and, and they can't really afford to pay you what you what it really deserves. I actually ran into that this weekend. I had a, um, I'm a DJ. I do event lighting and, and stuff like that and um, music and sound systems and all that fun stuff. I had a quote for a holiday party. And I usually take the winners off because most of my work is weddings during the summer, high, high profit weddings. And, um, I had this, it was a referral from a friend who knows what I do. And they reached out and I gave them like a very reasonable quote for the area. That's less than my normal, even just deposit, let alone the full retainer. Hmm. I'm, I'm here. I might as well just take on a job. And it was, I knew that the instant I sent the quote out, I knew that it wasn't going to go anywhere, but I'm not going to lower my prices to the point where I just take the job. But I gave him the quote, 
sure enough, text him two days later. Hey, any word on this? Oh, we found someone else. And it's it's like you, you kind of have to almost walk that line where do you want the job and the work or is it too much to even be worthwhile? Mm. Can you maybe talk about how you kind of go about analyzing a job and the the economics behind it if it's worthwhile? Absolutely. And you raise something that I think is a trap that so many agency owners fall into, especially as they start to build a team where they start focusing on quantity of revenue and they lose sight of the quality of the revenue. Exactly. And that's the Achilles heel of our business model, right? Is it doesn't we don't have a fixed cost to deliver to a client. That is the nature of a service. The cost basis for us is contingent on the volume of time that's required to deliver the outcome to the client. So it matters what the price is because it matters what the cost is. And so if we're thinking about a job, there's these two ideas that I think we need to separate that are often conflated as being the same thing. We have the scope of the project and we have the price of the project. The price articulates what the client is willing to pay us to get this outcome or to get this deliverable. The scope articulates what it will cost us to earn that revenue and to deliver on the promise that we're making to the client. And typically when we are assessing the health of a project, it just comes down to one really simple metric, which is what is the delivery margin of that project? And delivery margin, you might think of as being exactly the same as gross margin or contribution margin. We created a separate term from it because I'm really tired of arguing with accountants over semantic issues. <laughs> okay, But for all intents and purposes, those are the same ideas. Okay, And the way that we calculate that is we look at how much is the client paying us? And we immediately want to strip out what we call pass-through expenses. So that's money that doesn't belong to you that passes through your agency onto another vendor. So in your case, Mike, where you're doing uh, you know, stuff with music and, and DJing and stuff like that, maybe you got to go rent some equipment for a gig, right? So that's pass-through expense. That money belongs to the rental shop. It's not your money. It doesn't matter what the rental shop's cost basis are. It doesn't affect your profitability. So that's pass-through. If you were selling ads, and you had advertising spend, that advertising spend is a pass-through expense. If you were doing a print campaign for out-of-home media, that print budget would be a pass-through. So you want to isolate the money that flows through you into external vendors. And what's left over is what we call agency gross income, or AGI. That is the important number because that's now the money that's left over for you and that you now need to earn with your time. So that's the basis for the profitability of the project, your agency gross income. The next thing you want to do is understand what are your delivery costs. And that's largely going to be a function of the time that's going to be required to earn that revenue multiplied by the cost basis of that time. So let's say you have three people working on a project. One is a strategist, another is a copywriter, and the third one is a designer. Each of those people have a different cost basis. So you take how many hours you think it's going to take for them to do this work. You multiply it by the cost per hour of that person. And that'll total up your delivery costs. And what you're looking for is a delivery margin of 70%, roughly, at least 50%, but you want to try to get up to about 70% on a project, generally speaking. And if you can do that, what that allows you to do is lose about 20% from the project to the PL for things like utilization and gaps in work and overages, spend another 30% on your overhead running the business, paying for your lawyers, your accountants, your office, whatever and have about 20% left over as profit. So that's kind of the starting point for assessing the health of a job. And that framework, I think, is really special because the way that that math works, it doesn't matter if you bill by the hour, if you bill a flat rate, if you bill on value, if it's a project, if it's an ongoing recurring thing, the math is always the same. The way we measure delivery margin is all the uh, always the same. The way we isolate pass-through expenses is always the same. So we can actually compare all of our work in a relative basis. And the way that we measure that delivery margin is important too, because it's horizontally consistent. So you can look at any time period and apples to apples compare two projects to each other, because we're not trying to factor in externalities that are fluctuating all over the place. So that would be the mistake with doing something like trying to figure out what is the net profit on a job, which is like a fundamentally flawed concept, because that won't ever be the same calculation from one time period to another. So you can never compare two things to one another because it's not the same comparison. Does that make sense? Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. It does make you me can tell I though. think about this a lot. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you too, you, you, you brought it up there and, and given uh, your aforementioned experience with David Baker, I wanted to talk to you about the value-based version of this. Uh, as you were breaking down the math mm -hmm. problem, we were talking about the, you know, well, you would multiply it by the cost per hour, stuff like that. Well, if everybody gets on board to this value-based pricing thing, 
And now all of a sudden you're value basing mm-hmm. your contractors, like for example. So in, in, in like our model, for example, we have a lot of contractors, but they have an hourly rate. So we can do that math that you're asking yep. about. But if everybody's mm-hmm. on value, so we start to figure out everybody's value, like how do we, um, you know, if, if basically you were given kind of a flat rate from each of your contractors, how would you say, you know, solve this math problem using sort of their, whatever they're considering their value based yep. off of? Yeah, it's still the same idea, right? You're that's actually a lot easier because now they've just told you exactly what they're going to cost you and you'll know what the price is from the client. The math is still exactly the same, right? So the framework doesn't change. The cost basis now instead of being hours multiplied by rate, it's just whatever number they gave you. Hey, it's going to be 10 grand for me to work on this. Cool. All right. So that's $10,000. What about you, Mike? Oh, you want 18 grand? Great. You're 18 grand. My costs are 28. What's my price? Is the margin there? Bingo, bango. This is the big misconception, though, with value-based pricing that really, really gets under my skin is people think, as soon as I start pricing on value, I no longer have to care what it costs me to earn this revenue, which Mm. conceptually makes no sense at all. But that seems to be how a lot of people actually, and I've seen this in big agencies where they start value-based pricing, they stop tracking time, they stop thinking about costs, they stop thinking about timelines, they just think, oh, we're charging more money now, so it doesn't matter how much it costs us. And what they start to experience is indigestion. They think they're starving, suffering from starvation, but I'm like, you're making, you know, you have six million dollars in top line revenue. The fact that you're not profitable is an indigestion problem, not a starvation problem. You've got more than enough revenue. It's just that the quality of that revenue is not being focused on. Yeah, no, that's a great point because, yeah, I mean, in my experience with other agencies and working with freelancers and stuff like that that do this value based pricing model. And, and we've tried doing it ourselves to some extent. I, I can say, I mean, we do a flat rate but that is sort of value-based, but I don't know that we're totally, yeah. uh, it, you know, using the exact frameworks that some of these guys espouse. But, um, but we're, you know, ostensibly value-based. And so, but you're right. I mean, it is easy to kind of forget about all those practical matters when you're not chasing the hours, you know, because a lot of times, right. and just in our situation, most of our contractors are hourly-based. And so they give us, you know, a, a number of hours or flat rate to do the job. And then we calculate our, you know, our, our needs in terms of profit and everything kind of like you're describing here. But, um, Mm -hmm. but it is funny. Like just even thinking of my own experience, you know, not so much under our current model, but under a prior model, we were really bad about that where it was just like, well, we're charging enough money that it should be able to catch all and like, it'll be fine. So we'll just let it go. And then we get a bill for a few extra hours and we don't think about it and it starts eating into those profits and starts cutting up that bill. Yeah. So, uh, so it's really 100%. interesting point that you bring up. So, because I think that, uh, especially for a lot of young designers and agencies that are making the switch to value base, they start thinking about it as like, oh man, we're going to be making so much more money. We're billing all this extra money. We're doing all that stuff. And yeah, it's funny. You totally lose sight because we're not supposed to be tracking our time anymore. So, so it's like, but if you, if you stop paying attention to all those things, then all of a sudden your value, you know, you may be getting more money for it, but it's, it's funny how quickly it can be capitalized. Yeah. And that's the thing, right, is uh, an increase in price only benefits the agency to the extent that it separates the price from the scope. And that's the thing we got to keep remembering is there is no value in doubling your price point if you triple the scope of work that you're doing. That's less good for the agency from an efficiency perspective. You'd be better off being smaller. You probably end up making more money. So is there a way to accurately define scope up front as far as like, other than verbally and contractually having it out yeah. there, like this is what I'm doing and this is what X will cover. Um, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, right, Mike? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so this That's is... The thing. Something like software, for example, that scope creep is huge in that. Like it's very easy to say, all right, I want this to do this, but you don't yeah. take into consideration all the other elements that make that work. This um, is where I think we've got a bit of a different perspective on pricing and dare I say that our perspective is maybe a little bit more nuanced. Um, The last 10 years in our industry, I think we'd all agree, has been hyper-focused on pricing innovation as the way to combat our eroding margins. Our our margins are always under pressure, but positioning and pricing have been the two biggest topics of the last decade. I think that's a big part of the reason that David Baker has had such a successful career in the last decade, because those have been kind of his two major calling cards is positioning and then value-based pricing, especially in tandem with with, uh, Blair Ends, and both incredibly important concepts. So everyone is focused now on value as the focus of a pricing conversation. But the thing that nobody's talking about is risk. Right. And risk corresponds to 
how accurately can we predict what it's going to cost us to do this work? And there are even scenarios where it's not only that you can't predict it, it's that you shouldn't even try because that would actually be counterproductive for the methodology that you're employing to solve this problem. So if we're using the agile methodology, for example, to solve a problem, it would actually be in our it would not be in our best interest and it wouldn't be in our client's best interest for us to try to predict how long it's going to take to do that because the whole point of agile is we work we learn and we iterate and we keep doing that until we deliver business value so to try and put that process in a box would be counter to the process itself so in that case it's like i shouldn't even be really trying to put rails around this and scope it up front so how do you price something like that Mm -hmm. and the way you price something like that is you use the pricing model that everybody says sucks and doesn't work <laughs> and that you can't scale a business on. And yet, for some reason, the biggest consulting companies on the planet for the last three decades all use this pricing model almost exclusively. It's called time and materials. It's billing by the hour. And the argument against billing by the hour is, well, you can't scale a business on it. You can't make profit on it. But that's that's not true. We just talked about the formula for profit. It's cost relative to price. So as long as your cost basis is 30% or 40% or 50% of what you charge by the hour, you're fine. You don't have as much upside, but you're protected from downside because if the scope changes or if the scope is hard to predict, you're getting paid for your time. And so that's the thing that I think not enough people are considering when they're thinking about pricing is the singular objective is not just to charge as much as possible. It's to make as much profit as possible. And we get so obsessed with chasing this potential upside of having a flat or value-based rate. And in a perfect scenario, we come in way under budget and then we make all this extra profit. But what we're not thinking enough about is, yeah, but what if it takes us three times more than what we thought it was going to to get this done? And how do we protect ourselves in that scenario? And sometimes saying, you know what, let's share some risk with the client and bill hourly or bill on sprints or some abstracted version of time materials billing. That's actually the better way to do it. It's a better contract model to facilitate the solution. And it protects you from all of that variability in scope. And from a margin perspective, all we're doing is instead of trying to predict what's the cost of the whole project, we're just trying to predict what is the cost of a unit of time that we're selling to the client. And as long as our margin is good at that unit of time level, then we should be okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, In your bio that we got, I I think they referred to that as the pricing quadrant. Yeah. Is that that what you're talking about right now is the pricing quadrant is like defining which type of billing you're looking for? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So the, the pricing quadrant has those two axes, right? You have value, which is kind of the vertical axis, and you have risk, which is the horizontal one. So the four kind of scenarios are if you have low value, low risk, or sorry, low value, high risk, that's typically hourly billing, right? I bill you this much per hour. You pay me for the amount of hours it takes. If it takes 50, great. If it takes 100, great. We get paid for our hours. And again, as long as your margin's good on that hour, you're fine. Then you have low value, low risk. That's typically where you use a flat rate. So you'll say, hey, I'll give you this website for five grand. And you know it's not going to take you that much time and you've done it a million times so you can increase your hourly rate by being efficient then you have the high risk high value that's typically where you're using what we call abstracted time and materials so you might instead of selling hours you'll sell like a cross-functional team for a bi-weekly sprint so it's like hey this development team is ten thousand dollars per sprint we think it's going to take 20 to 30 sprints to complete the backlog And then if the client says halfway through, hey, we want to change a bunch of stuff or we want to add a bunch of new features, the answer is always yes. And do you want us to do that before or after the other things that are in the backlog? Because they're paying you for sprints. So if it ends up taking 70 sprints to get the work done, as long as they asked for all the work that's getting done, you're good. You're getting paid and your margin is baked into that unit of time or that unit of of people. And then the last case is high value, low risk. That's typically where you get into value-based pricing where you can arbitrage the fact that there's high value, but you still have a low enough risk that you can price the risk into that value-based price. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think, I mean, cause obviously, I mean, I've been, you know, a part of a lot of these discussions around pricing and what's the right way to do it and stuff like that. So I think that's really good. Cause I think, you know, just the hourly billing model that, I mean, almost everybody still uses or are most familiar with either because it's easier to, to quote work that way, or it's more understandable by clients. So many people still fall into that process, uh, you know, or doing it that sort of older way. And so I think it's really good to sort of talk about these other things. And this constra- uh, yeah. concept of the abstracted time and materials is really interesting to me, too, because it's kind of 
I don't know, almost best of both worlds, right? Like you do get a little bit of that sort of value-based thing where it's not strictly hours tracked, but, um, but you were still able to give people mm. a flat rate and le- really let them understand what it's going to cost. And so, because I think that, you know, so much of getting a client to buy off on something is certainty, right? I mean, so the idea of just paying infinite hours, at least with our clients, isn't very appealing, you know, but, yeah. it, but if they know it's going to cost 12,000 bucks for this thing, or it's going to be $5,000 for this thing or 25 hours for this thing, whatever it is. As long as it's got sort of brackets around it, then they're pretty comfortable with it for the most part. It's the uncertainty yeah. that tends to be the issue. And I think sometimes with the value-based pricing, you can run into a scenario where maybe you see a value, but they don't see it, or maybe there isn't a metric to back it or, you know, some sort yeah. of something. And, uh, you know, maybe if you're really good at it, you'll have some of those metrics. But I mean, I think that, you know, that uncertainty, I think, can sketch people out sometimes. The thing with value too is that I think people get caught up in what the value of the service is to them, like what they think their service is worth. But in a value-based price conversation, what you think it's worth doesn't matter at all. It's only what it's worth to the client. And sometimes the same service is worth very different things to different clients, right? Because it, it comes down to two major factors. The first is your positioning and how many alternatives they, they believe that they have to solve their specific problem. And the second, the, probably the most important one is the relative value of solving that problem, where it's like, if I know I can improve any website's conversion rate by 10%, who's it worth more to? Apple.com? that does like a a billion dollars a quarter in sales through their website or, you know, some small e-commerce shop that does 10 K a month in sales, that same result is worth wildly different uh, amounts to those two companies. And so it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what it costs us to do it. The scope of work could be the same for those two outcomes, but the value is anchored to totally different things. So I think sometimes people lose sight of that, that it's like, even if you've figured out how to have a value-based price conversation, it's not always applicable to every client. Depending on who you're talking to, that might actually not end up being a winner for you. You might end up on the wrong side of that equation. Well, there's, it's sometimes the client doesn't know the value that you're bringing to the table, and so on. On our end, we almost have to educate them as to why, you know, why hire me instead of your your nephew up the street who just bought a pair of speakers from Radio Shack. You know, there's. There's a difference and they just yeah. don't realize that. And sometimes I get in the, it, it, like this, that gig I was just telling you about earlier that I sent a quote to when I know that, that they don't see the value. I, lots of times I don't even pursue them as a client because it's just not worth my time or effort to try and educate them to, as to why you would hire me instead yeah. of someone well, else. And I think Unless that, it's, you know, yeah, I, Go I ahead, think Brian. that goes back to, to Marcel's point earlier. You know, he, he didn't use the word exclusivity, but some of it is that, being able to sort of choose your clients. And uh, one of the things that he does that I think is particularly interesting is on their website, they allow you to apply for a call instead of just, you know, book a, a schedule call with us or whatever. You know, you have this form to fill out that's basically, you know, an application for a phone call. And this mm-hmm. sort of screams of that ethic of, you know, starting to meter who your client is and make sure that you're getting a good quality client. You know, I imagine, yeah. a, you know, plenty of people probably come to your website and say, oh, well, I want to be profitable. You know, I want to do this. And, uh, you know, but maybe they're not at a spot or like their business isn't where it needs to be for you guys to be effective, for example. You know, so through this screening process and, and you can elaborate on it, but through this sort of, yeah. you know, light screen, at least it probably does a fair bit of filtering out who needs a phone call and who needs the ebook. Yeah, so do you, 100%. Have, do you have the drop down in there that says budget. And then you have the four different <laughs> options and says you're way Starts too low. Don't even try. <laughs> yeah. We're not quite as uh, on the nose as that, but uh, the proxy for that is we get an understanding of their revenue and their profit in the last 12 months. And that tells us right away, um, can they afford what we do and will they get a return? Right. And our, our bar is if we can't get them easily a 10 X return on every dollar that they give us, we're not going to have the conversation and we're typically going to respond to them and say, Hey, just so you're clear, this is what our engagements start at. We typically work with companies that are here, but based on the problems that you told us you have in the intake form, here's some free stuff that might be helpful. And here's some other people that you might want to reach out to for some help on this. So we do try to be helpful, but I would say about a third of the people that apply for a call for us, uh, we don't, we don't end up getting on that call and we have to direct them somewhere else. Well, and I think that there's kind of, I don't want to call it greed. It goes back to, and I think Blair Ann's talks about this a lot too, the, the sort of feast famine cycle. 
And it's this, you know, concept of, you know, I need to, I need to rake in every dollar. I need to grab every client I've got, to, especially for young companies or, or, uh, boutique shops, you know, this is an easy trap to fall into where it's just like anybody that comes along, my God, dude, we got bills to pay. We got it. We got to take the job, you know, and they don't yeah. spend a lot of time, you know, or, or at least don't enforce the luxury of being able to choose who they work with. Even if that is an option available to them for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like it's something they can decide. And so I, I think that this screening methodology is, is a good idea. I mean, like the way that we do it in our business is we just flat out publish our rate. And so if mm -hmm. it's for you, cool. If it isn't cool, like, you know, and maybe that's not the smartest approach either. I don't know. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's different approaches for doing this, but a big part of it is you price yourself a certain way so that you're not doing a certain kind of work. And I can just even speak to it as just a, you know, a young freelancer back in the day you know, my first freelance rate was 25 bucks an hour. Well, there's a certain kind of client you get for 25 bucks an hour. It's, you know, in my, in my case, it, you know, wasn't the worst. I mean, I was doing business cards for strippers. I was doing, you know, <laughs> uh, all, all kinds of just nonsense work that was like, you know, not, not the kind of work that you would want to hang your hat on. Right. But I was a young designer. I was trying to get started as a freelancer. These guys would give me money in exchange for business cards. Business cards are easy. So, you know, we crank it out, but yeah. of course I was totally hourly back then. Right. So it was like, okay, I got your business card done in 30 minutes. I'd like $17, please. <laughs> you know? yeah. And it's like, you know, and it's pretty tough to make a living at that, you know? So over time, uh, you know, opportunities come along, clients come along, whatever it is that give you the opportunity to go, Oh, okay, well I can charge a little more for this or, you know, whatever. And the examples I always use, you know, when I'm talking to young freelancers about this stuff is like Pepsi is not hiring a $25 an hour designer. You could be a great designer. Yep. You could be an amazing designer for 25 bucks. Maybe you just have horrible confidence and you have really bad self-esteem and you just love $25. That's your, your goal. Like you could be the best designer on the planet and they're still not going to hire you. There's this whole perceived value thing, right? Where, I mean, you yep. need to be charging me $300 an hour so that I know you're serious, you know, because otherwise, you know, I, I don't even want to risk it, you know, for 25 bucks an hour. Mm. And so there's so much that goes into, you know, trying to figure out your price and trying to do this sort of screening step. But I think, you know, the way you're doing it is really intelligent. And I just kind of want to, I guess, go on this diatribe just to tell people to, you know, be conscious about your, you know, the people you choose to do work with. I mean, especially as a small business owner or a freelancer, like, I mean, a good client can make or break you, you know, or a bad client can make mm. or break you. And, uh, you know, and I, I know a number of people or a handful of people that, you know, have ended up leaving the industry because they're jaded on the type of work they're doing or they're not happy with what they're doing. And they don't see that they have control over this. You know, so uh, so I think it's cool what you're doing with that as a you know macro ver or micro version of you know this mm -hmm. this sort of screening or being selective about who you choose to work with. Yeah, I mean, we have to practice what we preach, right? And eat our own dog food, and th this kind of leads uh, perfectly into a segue here, which is talking about the things that really influence an agency's profitability or any service business's profitability, and why this these things like positioning being selective about clients, really sticking to um, a specific problem, the downstream impacts that that has on the metrics that actually lead to a better outcome. Um, but before I get into that, I just have to say like this example of doing business cards for strippers, I just had this image <laughs> in my head of, of like cinnamon at the chamber of commerce luncheon, <laughs> handing out her business right. card to somebody. And it exactly. says like her title is something like adult <laughs> entertainment performer or something like yeah, that. Specialist. specialist. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's, no, it's just funny. And I, I guess to put it in your parlance, is they, they would be peelers, I guess, but you know, it's the same difference. So, but, uh, uh, anyway, I digress. So, Let's let's talk a little bit about that. Like, why is that stuff so important? And when you get into the nuts and bolts of it, it comes down to deliver margin, which we talked about at the pricing level. That's really kind of the holy grail of metrics. If there was one metric that you were going to pay attention to in your business that would tell you if it was healthy or not, if there was one metric that I was going to pay attention to in your business, if I was, let's say, trying to buy it to evaluate what the potential is, I would focus on delivery margin. And as we come back to the previous example, that's really looking at what does it cost your business to earn revenue? So for every dollar of, of money that a client gives you after you take out all the pass through, what's left over after you've promised, you've delivered on all the promises that were made. And we want to have at least half of every dollar left over to pay for overhead and then leave a profit. And if that isn't healthy, it's really hard to get everything else in the business to be healthy. If your delivery margin isn't healthy, profit feels like it's happening to you as opposed to happening for you. 
But when your delivery margin is strong, then you can start to make decisions about, do I want to over or under invest in overhead? You can actually start to control your profit margin and whether you want it to be higher or lower. That's like a totally different experience that for a lot of people listening is foreign to them because they've never even, they have no idea what that feels like. They always just kind of feel like they're bracing themselves for that conversation with their accountant at the end of the year. And they're going to go drinking regardless of what the outcome is. They'll either drink to celebrate <laughs> or they'll drink to mourn, uh, you know, the death of their, their hard earned time and money. And so when you think about delivery margin, there's really three things that influence that. And the two biggest ones are what we call average billable rate and utilization. And so average billable rate measures no matter how you bill, whether you bill on flat rates or value or abstracted time materials or hours, for every hour that you or your team spends doing work for clients, on average, how much revenue does that create for the business? So again, you can measure and compare any project, regardless of how it's structured, against each other, because the formula is really simple. You take your agency gross income, which we discussed earlier, it's your revenue minus the pass-through, and you divide that by the number of hours that it took to complete the thing or to deliver on the promise that was made to the client. So let's say you had a project that cost $5,000 and you spent 50 hours on it, then you had a $100 per hour average billable rate. Again, it doesn't matter how you build for it. You could have just said, hey, it's five grand and then took you, 100, it, you, know, took you 50 hours. That's your average billable rate. And so... It sounds kind of too simple to be true, but if you can double your average billable rate, you can double the amount of money that your team can make without changing anything else about the business. And you can do that either by increasing your price, that's the obvious one, but the other one that no one's talking about is you can do that by getting more efficient at what you do. Mm -hmm. If you can figure out how to take something that used to take 100 hours and you can get it done now in 50, you can now do twice as many of those things, you can earn twice as much revenue, and everything else can stay the same. So that's really powerful. And this is where the positioning, being selective about your clients, right? Taking on things that aren't going to blow up your process, have you take more time, and then you can work on those processes and get it more efficient. That has a huge impact, but it all starts with being selective up front. And then the other side of that coin is utilization, which looks at, you know, if, I'm, if I have a team of five people and they all work full time, I'm basically buying 2000 hours of their year on the employment contract. And the agreement with an employee in a service-based business is I'm going to buy 2,000 hours of your life for this amount of money. Let's call it 70 grand a year. I'm going to go try to resell a certain amount of those hours at a profit. And if I do that, everybody wins. You get certainty and a salary. I get some profit and the client gets deliverables that they want at a price that's reasonable to them. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So the important question is what percentage of those 2,000 hours is actually end up being sold and spent on earning the average billable rate that I talked about earlier. And of course, the higher that percentage, the more likely it is that we're going to be profitable as an agency. And for most firms as a whole business, they're trying to get that number to be around 50 to 60%, which doesn't sound very high. But once you factor in all the internal time, the holidays, the vacation, the sick time, the paid time off, right, and all, all the internal projects and meetings that you have to have, that's kind of where you end up. And, and then factor in the fact that there's some people in the business that don't spend any time on client work. They've got to go out and do sales or they have to take care of finances and internal stuff. So as a whole, you want to try to get it, you know, around 50 to 60% of the total time that you buy from your team spent earning revenue. Those are kind of the two major levers that control delivery margin. And to give you a simple example, if I had a team of 10 people, they had 10,000 hours of capacity. 50% of that was utilized. That means 5,000 of those hours were spent earning revenue. And we earned an average of 100 bucks for every hour they spent. That team does a half a million dollars in revenue. If we take that same team and we get them up to 60%, they now did $600,000 in revenue. And if we take that same team and we hold the 60% utilization, but we bump our average billable rate up to just 125, they now do $750,000 in revenue. So think about that difference you know, we just went from 500K in revenue to 750K in revenue. What that means for their bottom line. In this example, if they, were, if they had a $300,000 payroll and they spent 150K on overhead, their profit margin went from 50K in the first example to 150 in the second to 300 in the third. So 10% to 40% EBITDA with these two little tweaks. That's the power of these two levers. So what you're describing 
makes sense. But <laughs> getting people to actually report their actual hours and actually like you, you must yeah. have a guy that all he does is a bean counter. Like he just tracks everything and has a spreadsheet that's ridiculous just to keep all these metrics straight. How, how do you, well, it, how do you get your employees to get jump on board with giving you the correct hours and give, giving the correct metrics to actually base all this off of? Because yeah. sometimes they've got enough on their plate and keeping track of, you know, it took me, three and a half hours to do this job and two and a half hours to do mm-hmm. that job. And then usually they don't do it right after they have to do it at the end of the week and they're guessing. So yep. is there a, a better way? That's a great <laughs> question, Mike, an astute question. And one that I get asked a lot, I'm going to step back and first address the, the major reason that most people struggle with this. And the major reason most people struggle with this is because they're not closing the loop between that time tracking activity and the impact that it has on those employees, right? So let's paint a picture. Let's imagine, Mike, that you work on my team and I'm going out and I'm selling um, projects and I'm thinking it takes 50 hours to do this project, but it's actually taking you like 75. But I just keep selling projects and I keep resourcing you like it takes 50 and you're working evenings, you're working weekends, you're absolutely slammed. How am I going to know that if we don't have data? How are you going to be able to identify, hey, I can't do six of these next month because they take me this much time if we're not sitting down and having that conversation where I'm showing you, here's the data that I'm making these assumptions based off of. And we don't have a feedback loop to say, well, your assumptions are incorrect because it actually takes me 75 hours to do this thing. And that conversation, that simple exercise of sitting down with the team and just showing them here are the decisions that we make based on this information. Here are the assumptions that we make based on the data that we're getting back from you. That doesn't happen. And so to the team, there's just they get to come up with their own story as to why we're tracking time. And it's often not a good story that they're coming up with in their head. It's usually something like they're trying to make sure that I'm busy enough. They're just trying to keep tabs on what I'm doing. They don't trust me. They're billing you know, the client by the hour and they just need timesheets for that. But the most important reason to do this is because it protects all the stakeholders in the business from being overworked, from being under-resourced, from the business not being profitable enough to keep everybody's job or having to lay people off the second you lose a big client. So closing the loop is probably the most important thing. The other factor is understanding what methodology is appropriate for tracking time. And a lot of people conflate time tracking with a whole bunch of things. They conflate it with billing for time. They conflate it with having time budgets for tasks. They conflate it with uh, timesheets. They conflate it with all kinds of different things. But the exercise of tracking time is really about creating a record of where time is going. And timesheets is one way to do it. But there's kind of two main methodologies and there's four major kind of ways to do it as a whole. The first is timesheets, right? So Mike, at the end of every day or whenever, go in and punch in this timesheet. Here's how much time I spent on each client, on each task, whatever level of detail that's at. On the other side of the spectrum, you have what's called resource plan-based time tracking, where I, as a project manager, say Mike is on my team, and my plan is that Mike is going to spend the morning on these clients and the afternoon on these clients for this much time. And then throughout the week, through check-ins, I'm just capturing material changes to that plan. Where I say, Mike, how was yesterday? You go, ah, it was okay, but I had a fire with this client, so I spent all day on them. And then I update to say, okay, that's what actually happened, and we're going to re-resource. And then in between, there are variations on that. So there's what we call assisted timesheets, which is where you're using things like device monitoring, AI tools, right, to help you track what you're doing and pre-fill your timesheets so you're not having to remember everything. You're getting some assistance from AI, and there's some great tools out there to help with that that don't expose that information to your employer. So you're the only one that can see it, Mike. And then there's what we call resource-assisted timesheets, which is where the resource plan pre-fills your timesheets, and then it's up to you to capture the material differences between what we expected to happen and what actually happened. So there's a spectrum to this, and filling out timesheets is not always the way that we have to create this um, this record of time. There's just operational considerations to figure out what's most feasible, what's actually going to work for the team. And underneath all of that, it's important to remember that precision and accuracy are not the same. And a lot of people conflate precision in timesheets with accuracy of that data. But the reality is it doesn't have to be very precise to be accurate and extremely helpful. 
at actually solving the problems that this is meant to solve, like figuring out that it takes way more time to do something than we thought and that we're overworking our team by not having a feedback loop on that. That was a yeah, rant. And then, no, it's, <laughs> it's a good rant. Um, you know, that, that 25 hour difference between 50 hours and 75 hours, uh, that cuts into your profits as well. Not just the overworking part of it. If you're billing at a certain hour, price per hour and you're adding $25, 25 hours to it that you're not accounting for that just cuts everything in, in half almost, you know, maybe not yep. in half, but you know what I mean? Well, and that um, happens a ton it, in it's agencies really, too. Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's crazy because I, I, like I bill a flat rate for me. I don't, I don't deal with a, a team or anything like that. So hearing all these different things that you guys have to go through that I don't just makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of times. And I mean, it, I, and I think for a lot of, from being in, in bigger agencies too. I mean, it, it, at least in my last agency, there was like a silo between account management and creative, right? Each of us sort of ran yeah. our own thing. You know, we were tasked by, you know, to do stuff by our account managers, but the account managers handled the money. So they were going and they were making bids and doing estimates and creating all the stuff and never even really talking to us, you know, basing it yeah. on, old, you know, how long did it take us to do that thing last time or whatever. And then we'd occasionally run into these situations where it's like, oh, okay, well, you bid them 100 hours, but God, I need 200 to do this. Like, we're not even close. And then those just go, oh, okay, well, we're going to lose on this one, so we have to win on the next one. And it's like, well, but we could have just solved it with conversation. Like, why don't you just come talk to us first? But, um, but yeah. at least in some agencies, the siloing is really a problem. And, and the problem with that, of course, is that the timeline is rarely the thing that's going to get moved. So where is that extra 100 hours coming from, Ryan? It's, it's usually coming from your evenings and your weekends. And so the employees at this agency end up subsidizing a lot of this mismanagement of the business, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it probably does end up affecting the leadership team and the ownership team in terms of profits. But most of that whiplash is actually going to impact the team too because who who gets laid off when profits aren't good who gets laid off when our utilization starts to dip a little bit because our utilization has to be insanely high because we're over servicing the shit out of every client it's the employees that end up paying for this so that's the thing that i think is really challenging for me is there's a lot of resentment in the industry about things like tracking time about things like paying attention to these metrics because time tracking has been used the wrong way by a lot of agencies for a long time but all of this really is meant to protect the team and create an environment where they can, you know, be asked to work a reasonable amount of time and have some amount of buffer because the, the business is financially successful mm -hmm. to not have to fear for their job every time a client slips or they lose a big bid. Yeah. Well, and in fact, I mean, that's what happened to me in my prior agency, where, you know, the last time I worked for somebody and it's a big motivator for why I don't work for somebody now is that, you know, I mean, we were working nights and weekends, we were working crazy hours to, to accommodate for these kinds of issues. And the, you know, I mean, to your point, it just never got to management, right? I mean, they, they had no idea what was going on. But some, you know, person right out of college is, you know, brokering these big, you know, $50,000, $100,000 deals, you know, or bigger even. And, you know, they just, you know, they, they weren't talking to anybody, you know, so we're the ones picking up all the slack. And so as, a, as you know, working on the creative team, you know, you start to resent your account managers and you start to resent the people that are, are making you work over the weekend while they are seemingly off doing whatever they want to do, you know, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So I can see, you know, and I feel like, and maybe this is just my experience, but it feels like at least in the past agencies didn't really care that much. Like it was actually part of the culture that you would work your ass off. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. it, so it was sort of an expectation. And I remember earlier in my career when I was much younger, because now I, I couldn't do it. But, you know, you wanted to be the guy that worked overnight because then when everybody got to work in the morning, you'd just be like, oh, yeah, no, I just killed it. You know, I just did 24 hours. No big deal. You know, I just I rocked it, you know, for this client, you know, so there's like a little personal pride in being the, the one who was just totally abused, even though you yeah. didn't think about it that way at the time. And I think um, in the agency industry, thankfully, that culture is changing. There's more competition for talent. Firms just frankly can't get away with that anymore. The consulting industry at large is still very much like that. Unfortunately, there's still quite a bit of a culture. Like when, when I talk to friends that work at big consulting firms in places like New York, this is still their life. <laughs> and it's just a bill by the hour, mega high utilization, let the team subsidize poor management kind of situation. But in smaller firms, I think 
as a positive thing, we've come under a lot of pressure from both sides on margin, and it's forcing agency owners to be better stewards of this stuff. And I think culturally as well, um, a lot of agency owners tend to be more progressive, and uh, they have experienced that, and they don't want to subject their teams to that because they're you know um, they're fairly conscientious human beings. And so yeah. um, the underlying thing, though, is I think the common reaction is I'm going to reject everything that I learned at my last agency, like time tracking and timesheets and budgets. And like, I'm not going to do any of that stuff, no project management. But what they inevitably realize when they start to scale their team is actually, we need all of that stuff to accomplish the things that I want. If I want to protect my team, that's the only way to really do it. Because otherwise, you end up with these problems. And what they find themselves hearing is they sit with their accountant who's telling them they're overstaffed and then they go sit with their team who tells them that they're overworked and they have no idea what to do about this and who's right and who's wrong and how to even get to the bottom of what's happening and how to fix it and that's well, where and these for, operations metrics clarify it yeah and and in a lot of cases you know these people you know in my case it was a design team but like i mean we're not even at the table about these problems or these issues right i mean like nobody's talking right. to us at all so in terms of our ability to affect it positively one way or the other, it's, it wasn't even on our, you know, not even something we're capable of doing. And in fact, you know, I mean, yeah. ultimately the reason I left that agency was I was laid off and I was laid off because they lost a client that I didn't work on. And, uh, but I was one of the more senior people on the team. And at the time it happened, like, you know, to, the, to your point about mismanagement, the money that I was generating should have been allocated or something earmarked for our team or for my, you know, for me. So I should have been generating the income that keeps me employed. Instead, you know, somebody somewhere else, you know, dropped the ball or they ended up losing an account and, uh, you know, and then they just made sort of a global cut, you know, took the yep. high payroll out. So sort of, that, I mean, it's unfortunate. And, you know, I, I mean, everybody that runs that agency is great. I'm still there, maybe their top freelancer. Like, I mean, we still do a ton of work for that agency. So I love them and, you know, no hard feelings at all, but it's just, you know, the agency experience that they offered, which was probably better than the bigger shops in the New Yorks and the LAs, um, is still, you know, it, it, nothing like what I wanted to do in my own business. So that's why we've, uh, we've it managed to stay on our own for so long. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, we're actually getting kind of late, so I don't know if I can get to both my questions, but I wanted to ask you as sort of an entrepreneur, you talked a little bit about positioning yeah. and things like that. And you're talking, I mean, obviously from a, a point of expertise in this field, but like, you couldn't have been at this level when you started your business. And so I wonder if you talk a little bit about just positioning your own business and sort mm -hmm. of the sophistication that you've developed now, you know, versus probably where you were when you spun off your first agency and just talk a little bit about how you positioned yourself, how you chose. I mean, cause you know, like you've mentioned, even in this conversation that a lot of your, uh, I don't want to call them tips or pointers or whatever, but a lot of the advice you're giving would apply to any service industry. So why do you only work yeah. with agencies, for example? You know, so can we talk a little bit about just your own experience as an entrepreneur in positioning? Not necessarily, I mean, of course, everybody wants, you know, here's the advice, you know, you should niche down, you should be more selected, you should be all this stuff. But I'm just mm -hmm. curious how you actually did it in your own profession. Yeah, that's a great question. And I can go a little bit late um, to answer these because I think they're important. So um, the first, it's funny, the first tech business that I wanted to start was like, the exact example of what you shouldn't do <laughs> when you're starting a business and trying to position. My idea was this. Let's just rebuild Google, but make it social purpose. So you get to choose, Ryan, like a percentage of the ad spend that generate that's generated by you using the search engine gets directed at a charity of your choice. Turns out that already exists. It's called Ecosia. They're specifically like a, a nature fund. But um, I just like you know, like a complete idiot was just like, oh yeah, Google has like 50,000 engineers, but me, a guy with no technical expertise and no money and no resources. Yeah, we could just rebuild whatever they did. That's not going to be <laughs> difficult. Like, and you think about like the scope of what Google does, th there's so many things. So that was like super dumb. So I didn't start to your point where, where we are today. And I think this lesson is learned through realizing it's a thing that you hear a lot when you're a young entrepreneur, but you don't really appreciate until you're older that like ideas are worthless. Execution is everything and execution mm -hmm. is exponentially harder, the, the larger the surface area of the problem that you're trying to solve. And today I have, I think, a really clear framework for how I think about this, where um, we talk a lot about the concept of an MVP, a minimum viable product, especially in software. But I think this is a more pervasive concept in entrepreneurship today in general. 
And minimum viable product is this idea in kind of the lean startup ecosystem where it's like, what's the smallest, most lean, most like quick to build solution that you can create to test if anybody will buy your thing, if you can deliver value, et cetera. But I actually think there's like three MVPs that come before the product. And the first is the minimum viable problem, right? What's the problem that needs to get solved? And that has not changed in the six years that Parakeeto existed. But we identified a problem. We went out, we figured out that a lot of agencies have that problem. And that problem has not changed. We've just deepened our understanding of it. But it's still the same problem today as it was back then. And if, if anything, it's gotten even worse now for agencies. Then the second P is minimum viable point of view. And this is something that gets overlooked a lot. But what is your unique point of view on why that problem exists, why it hasn't been solved yet, and what the right way to solve it is? And this is incredibly important, especially if you're creating a new category of product, because you have to be able to articulate, here's why all the other product categories don't really address this problem. And here's the new kind of set of criteria that needs to exist for something to really solve this. So we early on, again, developed this point of view of the existing solutions are basically finance data. And I could clearly articulate, here's all the reasons why looking at finance data in the rear view mirror that tells you that you're not profitable, it doesn't tell you why, is not a solution to the problems that you face every day in your agency. Then the third one, and this is the one that we skipped over for almost three years, is minimum viable process. So what are the actual steps that you need to take a client through to get a, a consistent outcome in solving that problem? We skipped right to trying to build software for like the first three years that we existed. We wasted a lot of time and money trying to build software before we actually understood a process that we could automate or repeat with software. And so it was when we switched to doing more consulting leveraged with software that we really accelerated our understanding of the process that created repeatable results. And then, then it makes sense to build a product because a product is just a packaged process or a system that repeats mm -hmm. a process, right? But until you've kind of checked those first three things off, it doesn't make sense to go in and build the product. And so that framework is really useful. And I think it helps with the positioning because it's like everything, every other opportunity that's come across our plate and every other temptation that we've had to expand, we run it through that filter and it becomes really evident really quickly that like the implications of trying to adapt this to something else are significant in terms of how it impacts the problem, the point of view, the process, and eventually the product. And yes, our vision is to eventually serve all the professional services verticals, but I'm not naive to the operational drag that that would create for us. And so it's just taken, it's just about having the discipline to say, we want to go slower now so we can go faster later. Um, because at, to your point earlier, if we just started taking on all that work, we'd experience a lot of indigestion. We wouldn't be as profitable. Our marketing wouldn't be as potent. And uh, it would dilute the potency of our point of view and our process in the short term because it would be less specific to solving that that really, really pinpointed problem for one person. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And, and it's something that like even in our business, we still kind of struggle with. We sort of were founded on what I imagine is a trajectory for a lot of people like me, which is a it, it basically an extension of my freelance business. Right. We, we got to yeah. the point where my freelance business outgrew me. And so I had to start bringing on additional resources to help out. And so we grew. And so the problem for us, and, it, and it's still a problem. I mean, I, I keep feeling like we're inching closer, but we just can never really seem to get to a threshold where I go, you know what? Damn it. We made it um, is in this sort of positioning realm. Right. Because just my life experience as a designer is really diverse. You know, I mean, I've worked across every industry. Mm. I've worked across, you know. And at really high levels, you know, so it's like, okay, well, we're capable of doing anything for everybody. So, you know, if we can do that, if that's our pitch, you know, how come we don't have, you know, business coming out of our ears? I mean, we can do anything for anyone. It's perfect, you know, but, um, but that sort of lack of position or that, you know, position of being yeah. able to do everything really isn't a position at all. And, uh, right. and so, you know, we've tried to narrow down and sort of recently we've uh, sort of uh, converted our business into something a little bit different, which is more of a subscription-based model for right now we're offering it to small businesses and to agencies. Um, although I'm thinking we may just even drill down further and, and just serve agencies. But the idea is right now it's really hard to find good people. Hiring processes are long and slow and you can basically hire a whole agency, exp you know, experienced agency, you know, professionals, uh, hire a whole team in one shot for a monthly subscription. Right. And so if you've got an agency and you just need to scale up in this month, 
or you need to, you know, uh, lay off and then replace with somebody, or you just need freelancers, you know, we can do it all in one big shot, you know, so you just pay a flat rate and that's mm. the thing. So we're, we've started to niche into being sort of an agency for agencies and um, our experiences in ad, ag- ad agencies and design agencies, but the, you know, but really it could be applicable to just about any sort of agency type business that needs to spin up personnel quickly. And so, um, but like even just in being wishy-washy about, do we do this for agencies and small businesses? You know, like the offering is so different and the people are so different and the, you know, the, the needs of a small business are totally different than the needs of an agency that just needs to speed it, spin up a team. And so, uh, yeah. so, you know, so as we're still doing this, but I mean, I've been in business 20 years, you know what I mean? And we're still just trying to figure out how to not be an extension of my freelance business. You know? <laughs> and so it's like, yeah. so this positioning thing is really challenging, but I love your, your framework here because you know, just as you were going through it and I'm trying to apply it to where we're at in sort of what we would call a positioning journey, a very casual positioning journey. Um, you know, it, I, I can see logic for refining even further, you know, and just picking one vertical mm. for now. And, you know, maybe we do the other under another brand name one day, but you know, right now we just do this, you know, sort of like you guys have done where you've narrowed into just doing agencies, you know, specifically, you know, yeah. so I, I think that that's really good logic. I like, I like that idea. Well, and I, what I encourage you to think about on that is like, what's the problem? Focus on the problem and all the other, I think, like tactical elements of niching that people get caught up in, which is like, what's the vertical? What's the service? Are we a Facebook ads agency or a YouTube ads agency? It's like all none of that stuff matters. What matters is the problem. And then you work back from that. Okay, well, what is the right point of view? What is the right solution? Who has that problem? Those things will fall into place. I think if you can get really clear on like, what's the problem that we are really, really, really good at solving, everything else kind of flows from that. That's why the problem is kind of at the foundation. And every time that we've been missing the mark or that it hasn't been working or we haven't been finding product market fit, it always came back to that stack. Like that has been a tried and true framework for us. Well, I, I love that you look at it like that instead of just a minimal viable uh, project or you know the output you look at what the problem is and then you find the easiest solution for that um, because there could be multiple project problems but if you start with the the most important one yeah or the easiest one or however it is just figure out what what solution you're going to solve and then go from there and then okay now i've got this functionality let's work on that functionality and then that Mm -hmm. functionality and kind of slowly grow at least you've got a product and something to get out there and start working on and then go from there Uh, i think a lot of a lot of people will get into something like a software project and it's so overwhelming because they've got a million problems they got to solve instead of just focusing on one and then going i'm sorry and that that base like you raise a great point, which has exactly been our experience, which is the times that we've like spent a lot of time and energy building the wrong thing, you know, spending time on things that didn't end up delivering value or that people weren't interested in buying or that didn't get the right result for the client. Um, when we struggle with those things, or and then we struggled with deciding what to do. The sobering question was always, well, what problem are we trying to solve? And when we would sit back as a team and be like, shit. I don't know. Like we're not on the same page about that. It's like, that's it. That's the issue. How could we possibly build a great service, a great product, a great offer, a great funnel? If we don't even know what problem we're solving. Yeah. It's like impossible. Exactly. And that's always been the kind of the thing that we, you know, it's just so easy to overlook. Yeah. No. And well, Marcel, right. we're kind of at that time. Um, do you want to tell people where they can reach out and, uh, a little bit more about Parkito? And, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Just yeah. tell, tell people how they can get in touch with you. Well, if anybody's listening and uh, some of the stuff around profitability resonated, you run an agency or service business, you want to improve that, I encourage you to check out our agency profit toolkit. It's a free set of resources complete with training videos and free templates and checklists and tools that you can access at parakeeto.com forward slash toolkit. Um, so definitely go check that out if uh, any of that stuff resonated. If you want to follow me, check me out on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place. And uh, I also have a podcast called the Agency Profit Podcast. You'll never guess what we talk about on the show. Uh, and of course, <laughs> parakeeto.com if you want to learn more about our company. Awesome. Well, thanks Love so it. much, Marcel. This has been uh, awesome. Well, really th- good thanks information. Thanks again. Yeah, I appreciate it a lot. Thanks, man. Appreciate you guys having me. Absolutely. Thank and you. Thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. See you guys next time.